Thank you, Isidro, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming out on a rainy night. I hope, you will, I hope we, myself, and my colleagues who have come here tonight can keep you interested and uh, share with you our excitement about this topic that we're going to talk about. So um, I, myself, am an independent consultant. I don't do engineering, I don't do software engineering, but luckily I have uh, people who do know about this here, here with us tonight to talk and share with you from their ideas uh, on the subject of discovery. So I'm going to begin by first talking about um, you know, why did we come to talk to you here tonight? What, why did we come here? Well, it's a beautiful city, of course. Everybody knows the architecture is great. Mobile World Capital is a very important um, component of the reason that we came. Because you are here, you developers are here, you have created an ecosystem around augmented reality tools and experiences that we think is very exciting. We hope that after this evening, you will raise your hand and say, yes, we want to work with Christian, Michael, me, and there's maybe 10 other people on the planet who want to work with you on the topics that we will, we will discuss tonight. So as I said, we, we want to talk with you after our presentations because you have many experiences that I think are lost. The experiences are there, but nobody can find them. Or we think that you believe it's very frustrating to have technology silos in a block, and you would like to learn and work with open architectures, things like link data and open street map and things that are open and offer you more possibilities. And we'd like to work with you to demonstrate augmented reality discovery in Barcelona, a proof of concept for um, in time for Mobile World Congress in February. So that's why we came. Now, what is augmented reality discovery? Well, first, it's a big problem. It has to do with too much data, big data. So it's related to the idea that there's, we can't find the exact information we want. It's like when you go to a museum that doesn't have a good director, and it's just chaos. You can't figure out what you like the best that selecting what you as an individual need and like the most is called curating. It's, 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 a, it's like a, being a very good um, gardener, you know, in the, in, the, in the field to make sure that you have the food that you like to eat. So curating is a process of looking at too much content and selecting only that which is of interest to the audience, okay? That could be audience of a magazine or a museum or any, any kind of audience. Discovery is also a problem that's related to search. But the problem, if you talk about discovery and search together, is how do you search for something you don't know is there? What words are you going to use? What, what, you know, are you going to put a date in? Where do you put the date? If, how do you, how, where's the search window for augmented reality? So the physical world is a great way of finding augmented reality, but where is it? What do you put into it? Well, discovery is search based on context. So if you can think of that, discovery is search based on the user context. Now there's other examples. Geospatial uh, data sets are huge. They had this problem already. People have been using keywords and location to find data sets in geospatial data for a long, long time. There's other examples. Uh, you know, when you go to the Play Store, you know, the Google Play Store, if you put in discovery, you're gonna find a game. This is not what I'm talking about. Just wanna make sure you know this is not the discovery that we are thinking of. 
What we want is that a developer has indexed their apps when they put them into the Play Store, and then the user gets a proposal based on their criteria. Okay? And that's that's something that has been people have been working on in Google Play Store for now a couple of years. In parallel, at the same time with the Google Play Store uh, discovery work, there's also something called Google Now. How many of you have used Google Now? Okay, fantastic. So when we started this work, we said, well, why don't we use some existing technologies to show how to do AR discovery? Sure, let's call it, talk to Google and ask them if they'll give us Google Now so we can use that context engine in the back to search for augmented reality experiences. Well, you know, we didn't even know where to find the door, who to ask. It's a big company. They're not so interested in us and our thoughts. But they are interested in context, and you are also interested. Everybody's interested in context. A human being is nothing but a bunch of context. I mean, we live in our own context. This is the augmented reality is all about the human, the user first. The user's at the center of everything in augmented reality. So of course there's where are you in space? Where are you on the planet? And there's many ways of finding out and defining where you are. And then there's of course some things that are around, other inputs, voice commands or noises, things that are picked up by the microphone or the vibration sensors in your, in your device. And of course the camera <laughs> and, and that can detect things around you. That's all part of context, right? So these things, are based on what we call sensors. The current sensors are what we call the observations that are gathered by the sensors that are in your mobile device. Might be your head mounted display, might be some other wearable or smartphone, who knows. But what's clear is that in addition to all this current context, the immediate context, there's other things that define context. So what time is it compared to other times of day? Maybe if you're hungry, you know, if it's, if it's in Catalan, maybe if it's uh, 10 o'clock at night, you know, you need to give somebody some more information about food. But there's other kinds of context that people can figure about themselves, their age, their gender, etc. And we can go on, you can say, well, the context is that you have five networks around you, or you have three devices that are connected to you. That's all part of your context. And maybe your context is also not just that you're here, but that you were in another city or another part of this city just a few hours ago. So that's all part of a temporal context. So this defines the current user state and the past user state. Now, what can we do with that? If you know what the context is, Okay, let's just start adding all these different pieces of context into a search. Hmm, a query, a search query. Everybody knows about a search query. So maybe we're going to talk about, hmm, what is that user looking at? Let's use that as part of the search query. Where it has been? Another part of the city, and now we're here. What are you doing? Did you just finish washing your hands? Did you just finish... Uh, did you just wake up? What is the task that you're doing? What have you done before? What's going on around you to be part of that? Okay. That's what discovery is. Now, some people have said to me, Christine, you're trying to solve a problem nobody has. I said, well, wait. Just wait. We will have the problem that this technology addresses. It's just a matter of time. So I'm gonna take you on a journey in time forward. You know, I don't know how many years, it's up to you. You've gotta develop more experiences. But there's other people who are involved in the future as well. First of all, let's uh, jump ahead and say there's no technology constraints. That means unlimited memory, unlimited computational power. Networks are fast. The sensors are small, cheap, and they're everywhere. We're all wearing all these devices and it all works together in a nice way. We'll hear more about that. And at the same time that you have no technology constraints, you guys have been very, very busy. And there's just hundreds, thousands of pieces of content that are attached to everything. This room, every 
human being, every product that's made, from the time it's conceived, the time it's born, until it's dead, is just a magnet for more experiences, more content. It's associated with it, but we can't see it today because you don't know it's there. It's invisible. It's digital. It's not in the real world until I discover it. That's the problem. So there's going to be augmented reality experiences everywhere, on every object, every place, every person. And it's not just one piece of content. There's commercial content. Ah, this is for sale. Oh yeah, there's a brand here. Uh, there's lots of commercial kinds of content. You see it. There's public data. There's personal data, there's group information. So there's lots of different kinds of overlapping data that all talk about the same person, place, or thing. So how are we going to solve that problem? So I just took you in the future and said, there is a problem and there, it's fiction, right? We're out there in the future and you've been busy. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna replace a whole bunch of manual steps that you have to do today, and we're gonna make it all automatic. And it's not just automatic, it's happening automatically all the time in a very lightweight way. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to describe, to define discovery. So I'm more interested in telling you what, what it will be like when we have it. It's more easy to tell you that we will have the best augmented reality experiences just for us individually at the time where we are. That's the miracle of discovery. So let's review for just a few minutes, because you're busy right now, right? Every day you're coding new experiences. This is what you do. Here you are, developers, physical world all around us, digital content, you're creating that digital content, you get it from repositories, you have models, CATIA and Max 3D and all that stuff. You pick your authoring tool of the day, I don't care which one you pick, and you take your authoring tool, you mix together the digital data, the feature extractions, and you have experiences. This is what you have today. That's the first step. Huh. That was hard enough, but it's not over. Now you have to take what you created with the tool and publish it, and it has to be delivered, You're getting closer to the user. And the user's not even on this picture yet. You're now, you know, you spent money, you spent time, and you have gone through these different steps. Now, what's happening in that publishing word there? One of two things happens today. Either you are going to deliver your experience in an AR browser, which is just a native app called a browser. It's not really a web browser, right? It's something else. You know what it is. Layer and Wikitude and Janio, and there are others, many others, uh, Erasma, there's other browsers. They all function in pretty much the same way, which is that you've got the outputs of a experience authoring tool. Somebody has helped or you have put in some policies about who gets to access it, how much money they pay, things like that, and you load it on a, a server, but the browser vendor has a content proxy server that redirects any request. Is everybody okay? Do you understand? This is common. This is what we do today. Unless you happen to be using some other tool, and you're not going to deliver with an AR browser, what you prefer to do is you want to create your own standalone app. And so you're going to create using Unity or other tools. You're gonna to use some SDKs and plugins, and you're gonna create a, a complete app. Maybe it talks to the cloud and gets some data every once in a while when it needs it, but it has feature tracking, has you know, feature detection and tracking and a user interface, and you control all of that in advance. Then, if you're really bright, and you're really lucky, Apple allows you to put that app on their app store and you can sell it or give it away, and then you have to maintain it, and two months later you're now doing it again and again and again, okay? So it's a long process, but what I'm proposing, and this is just one of the scenarios, it's not the only scenario, I'm proposing that there's a new pro 
process between publish and delivery. And it introduces something, it's a host, yeah, a server, you know, a host, that runs some services in the way that we think of services in an engineering way, not like catering services or transportation services, but engineering services. And that the, the publisher of the experience, the developer of the experience, who's also the publisher of the experience, he registers these experiences with a catalog. This catalogs, I'm using the term very broadly, I don't care how many there are, maybe there's a Barcelona catalog and a transportation catalog, I don't care how many catalogs, I don't care how we divide them up, but what will happen is that there's metadata that's registered in a catalog and it says, I am describing this experience that I've created over here. If you see anybody who has contacts that wants to get it, let me know, I'll help, I'll help them get it. So what happens is, the user, the end user, they just got their new iPhone, whatever, their new glasses or something. They got to do some configurations. They got to make sure that the you know, optical distance is right. And other settings, they say, my name is, and I care about art or architecture or something. And you know, I really, I, I, I have different preferences, right? I don't have to tell you, these are preferences. And I select my set up my client application in some magic way, but then, it talks, it, it gets some data that, from the sensors, and this behind the scenes, completely hidden to the user, all transparent to the end user, there's these systems are talking to each other and saying, yo, I've got a context, it just changed, my context just changed, and I think that person might now be interested in something they didn't know they needed. I'd like to make them aware of it. So, when there's a match between the query and the catalog, Discovery service says, oh, I think I need, you know, on behalf of this user, I'm going to, I'd like you to package up some content and send it to that user. And that's what happens. The experience goes to the AR engine, the UI is already there, and it delivers those experiences if and when the user's conditions match. Okay? So, this is one way, and then, oh yeah, and then, the user says, okay, yeah, I like that experience. I think I want to use that. And they, the, the experience is finally presented to the user. That's what I call it in my language. So the user is in the physical world. Physical world gets some stimuli. Sensors, whether they're distributed sensors or on the device. In this picture, they're on the device. The catalog has sent the experience to the device. The device says, oh, yes, it matches. Fantastic. There's an event, and I'm going to render the, op the augmentation and deliver it to you at that time. So, who benefits? Well, I think that if we have discovery, the experiences that are of the highest value to that individual user at that time will be available without a lot of work, a lot of extra work on the part of the developer as well as on the part of the end user. And then if if, if they are lucky, then they might pay for that too. It's really valuable. They'll say, oh yeah, that's much better than going through 20 manual steps. So the benefits of discovery are that the publisher has a much larger potential audience, it's based on context, and it reduces the need to create these individual applications for the experiences over and over again. The end user has the greatest possible number of applications and experiences, this, it's all automated, so that's good, it's simple. Preferred client applications, I can choose the piece of hardware I want, the software client I want. If I want to use Michael's system, I can use it. I get to choose, and it's the catalog that's sending me the information, or the discovery service that's only sending me what I need when I need it. By the way, see anything missing here? Remember the ecosystem, one of those pictures had you guys were using the tools published by Matayo and Euphoria and all these other, ah, they don't benefit. They're left out of this. I don't care. Because ultimately, it's those who develop the content and those who consume the content that really are the engines of augmented reality. People who make the tools to go in between, great. I need to have tires on my car, but it's not the engine. The content is the engine. The developers are the engine, and the end users are the drivers. So what's missing? 
a lot of things. Remember, I took you way into the future. So there's not an intelligent network-based identity and data management system. This, those user agents that I, I showed a picture of, they don't exist yet. They might one day exist. There might be many people creating them. There are no experiences cataloged in a discovery service. And there's no relationship between many of the people who are publishers and individual users. There's a, all these layers between the two of you, so there's not a direct relationship. And it's sure that, you know, doing a query on a lot of context is kind of complicated, so maybe you're going to need to reduce the number of things that are in the query. There's a lot of issues around privacy, <coughs> privacy of the user, sending context around, there's some, there's some ways around this, if you care enough. There are ways around, I don't want to read these, but we can talk about different kinds of controls, different kinds of queries, how to aggregate queries. Okay, so I've spent 20 minutes to tell you about AR discovery, and I've been working on this for a little while, um, and I'm very fortunate to have other people who think this is an important topic, and so we've been working together. We have a mail list, and we get we conference calls every two weeks or something like that. There's a page with some past information, a webinar, and uh, a week. So that's what I wanted to tell you about. Um, just so you remember, uh, discovery benefits primarily the publishers, the developers, and the publishers of experiences, and the end users. The device manufacturers get in the game too because if the device capabilities keep increasing and you need more and more discovery capable devices, they get to sell you a new device faster. They're, they would be interested in that. And infrastructure, this is network providers, you know, because if there's more context moving around, more experiences being accessed, is more use of the network. The network becomes more valuable because of the services that are embedded in it. Right? So it does not increase the opportunity for the AR author. Don't expect the authoring platforms to provide this to you. It's not their business. Okay? And we think that there are some existing, exciting existing technologies that can be used to prototype it, work on some business models, and there's lots of opportunities. So I hope we'll be able to discuss with you if you're interested in working on a proof of concept on AR discovery in Barcelona. That's all, and we'll take the questions later, okay? So now, I invite my colleague Christian Grant to come up and to present 